Part of what's going on in Smyrna, even if you can, and just rejoice in the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Truly, as we said earlier, we said about the weather, uh, with the rain and all, it's been good as far as uh, especially those that need rain. What's going on with everybody? <clears throat> and uh, I guess you can get what you say, but some will be up called too much rain when you get floods and stuff like that. I think they have a little problem with China. And uh, many several lives is lost. <clears throat> but with no one thing, the world's not going to be more anymore. So 
So no matter how much it rains, <clears throat> it's not going to be water this time. Amen. Amen. So <clears throat> if you see fires burning in California, and it, it kind of makes its way to Utah, it kind of comes over to Oklahoma, and start moving over to Texas, then you can start worrying. Amen. But don't worry about the water. Amen. Truly, we thank God. And uh, at this time, we'd like to give honor where honor is due. First of all, to my Lord <clears throat> and my Savior, Jesus Christ, first of my life. Also to uh, my pastor, Bishop, Thomas Fowler. Amen. First Lady, Sister Sherry Fowler. Amen. To uh, the ministers. <clears throat> we have uh, L. Simpson here with us today, the Ashley Ministers. And uh, to all the deacons, Dick and Turner. Amen. Dick and Watkins and all the other deacons. And to the saints of the Most High God, <clears throat> we say praise the Lord to everyone. Amen. We acknowledge you here. You are very special. You are very important. Amen. If you wasn't, uh, the Lord wanted to set this son and lay his life down for you. So that's how important you are. Yeah. Amen. He values you. You are very much. Uh, he paid a heavy price. Mm -hmm. The ultimate price. Amen. For you. So never underestimate yourself for who you are. Amen. The Lord himself did that to make life better for you so that you wouldn't be lost, so that I wouldn't be lost. Amen. <clears throat> With that being said, we want to say a word of prayer in Jesus' name. Father God, we come before you in the name of Jesus. First of all, thank you for all you many wonderful blessings. We always pray that you would use us for your glory. But we find ourselves praying at this time as we stand before the people, because we want them to hear what we say when we say that it's not about us, that we're not trying to get the glory because it does not belong to us. But we want to say something that will be a blessing to the hearers. We do not know what people are going through, but you know. So we ask you to use our lips, our words, to speak as though it was you, and say what needs to be said to them that they may be blessed. And so I yield myself to you, Lord God, to be used by you. At this time, speak your word that others, Lord God, may be healed and delivered, set free, that they may be encouraged to go on in your name. And most importantly, for those who don't know you and your free part of the sins, that they will be pricked in their hearts to make that change, even on today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> amen. In the uh, book of Luke is where we're going to be. Book of Luke, one of the four Gospels. We're going to be in the fifth chapter. We'll give you a little time to find that. Luke, number five. And their net break. 
And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Now Simon Peter saw it. He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the trough of the fish was dead taken. And so was also James and John, the son of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Amen. Thus ends the that story right there. <clears throat> for this story, we want to use for a thought. Doing it God's way. Yeah. Just simply doing it God's way. All right. Uh, rehearsing the story again. We see here that Jesus had been on the move. He hadn't been moving around that long. He just pretty much, not long, got baptized, went up into the wilderness, and now he was uh, going to get his disciples, those that were chosen to be his disciples. And so after he goes from this place to that, preaching and teaching, he ends up at this lake called Lake uh, Gennesaret. Now, this lake was also known as the Sea of Tiberias, but well known today is called the uh, Sea of Galilee. If you go to Israel now, uh, the Sea of Galilee is the same place. And so, this is a well known place where men will go out and fish for the business. And in this location, you know, fishing was a very popular job. It was, it was a big job. There was a big demand for fish I mean, people had to live off of something, and people had to eat, and fish was abundant in this area. So there was a lot of people that was called fishermen that were out fishing. And Peter and John and James were also fishermen. And they were out here on this lake fishing. They had been fishing the majority of the night. I was assuming that fish bite better at night. And they had been out working and working and on this particular day, they had brought nothing in. Now, uh, fishing was not a type of job that you were going to get rich on. Uh, you had to work hard. Uh, you had to spend a lot of hours away from your family. You're going to be dirty and smelly, smelling like fish. And you're out in the heat. And you're pulling and pushing and throwing and grabbing and holding. And you just go out just to make enough to make a little something to have a decent life. And then on top of all that, there was a big competition because so many people were fishermen. It's sort of like cutting grass. If you want a job going out cutting grass, there's a whole lot of competition out there. Everybody's cutting grass. I'm kind of being your long warriors and how many weed eaters you got. Everybody's cutting grass, so uh, your price is going to be dropped way lower if you don't get customers because everybody's doing it. So it was with fishing. Everybody was fishing. So uh, in order to make decent money, uh, you had to compete with so many other fishermen. And so even if you brought in a little bit of fish, it was better than nothing. But you had a lot of pain that you had to pay besides taking care of your family. You had to always constantly buy new nets because these nets was constantly breaking and messing up. And, and then you got the, 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 the boats was made that were sailboats. So, you got the cloth constantly being beat by the wind, so you got to replace it with new cloth. And then you got you know, the stern, you got the the, 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 uh, the poles that goes up on the poles. There's something constantly that you got to replace and fix. Not to mention that your boat is hitting up against rocks and you got to patch them up constantly. So there's a lot of money you got to spend just to continue to be a fisherman. And then what's left is what you live off of. So if you go out and make a little bit, that was at least better than nothing. But if you made nothing that day, it was like that day was a total loss. That means that you 
you worked all night and you brought in nothing, that means you didn't make anything. Yeah, you, so therefore, you gotta come out of whatever savings you got to fix whatever you got on your boat or to feed your family. And if you didn't catch nothing today and you didn't catch nothing tomorrow or the next day or the next day, and this happened three or four days in a row, then you would pretty much almost go under. You would almost have to give up fishing. So you would get a hope that you would catch at least something, at least every other day, at least. And so we see here that these men, no doubt, were frustrated because they hadn't caught anything. They were somewhat hot and tired and miserable. And so at this time, they was bringing in their nets, getting them together, fixing them up so they can go home and spend the day with their family with nothing that they had made. And by this time, Jesus came up and he had a crowd follow him because at this time, Jesus was becoming well known. And folks was following him for so many reasons. Some for the right reasons, some for the wrong. Amen. They wanted to be... And you know how it is when somebody becomes famous? People want to be around somebody famous. Oh, yeah. They want to be in the mix. If there were cell phones back in those days, everybody would have been trying to take a selfie with Jesus. Just wanted to be around him. And we see here that he got a crowd around him and there's so many people that they all up on him. And so much that it's hard to speak to everybody because everybody's right up on him. And so when he came down to the sea, he said, well, I get out of this boat. That way people didn't get all up on me. So he got into, there were two boats out there at the time, and he got into one of them, which happened to belong to Simon Peter. And he got into this boat. Of course, when Peter saw what was going on, he told Peter to, to push it out a little bit, away from the people, so that he can talk to the people. Peter being respectful, because Peter no doubt had heard about Jesus and seen him in action. So he knew that, you know, he was a good man. But you gotta understand, Peter had seen a lot of people come through that was called good men, prophets, people got something good to say. So Peter, no doubt, at least being a respectful man, he would respect a man of God. At least even if the person called himself a man of God, Peter would at least respect him because he did not know if he was real or not. So instead of disrespecting somebody that might be real, Peter started off respecting him until he knew better. So at this point, Peter didn't have anything he could use against the Lord, so he respected him. And he allowed him to be in his boat, and he pushed it out a little so that Jesus could do what he normally do, that is preach. So he goes out a little further, and Jesus began to preach. Now, the people can't get all up on him because they, they got to run all up to the water and get to the boat to do it. And Jesus is sitting down in the boat, and you can imagine, I'm standing up in the pulpit preaching, and I'm pretty much just being still relaxed, but... Can you imagine sitting down in the boat, the boat's constantly rocking in the water. And he's sitting there preaching, but he's just rocking, because the waves is rocking the boat. And he's sitting there just rocking and preaching the word of God. Amen. It had to be a little bit of discomfort, but we're talking about God. And at least the people wouldn't have on him. And he was preaching, and it doesn't really say what he was preaching. Amen. But he was preaching, and he was convicting people, and he was touching people, and he was changing lives. And I don't know how long he preached, but according to the Bible, Jesus was known for preaching a long time. Amen. Uh, there are some occasions where they would say the sun was coming up. When they got through, they said the sun was about to go down. So Jesus would preach a long time. Amen. So don't jump on the preachers no more. I, I don't ever remember preaching all day. But he would preach until he was ready to stop preaching. And so at this time when he stopped, he looked at Peter and said, uh, launch out in the deep. Let your net down for a draw. Now, you gotta understand, Peter is a fisherman. And it's one thing when you're good at something. And somebody's talking to you that you feel is not good at what you're good at. Wow. Amen. Uh, I want y'all on the lineman, and a lot of times I go places and people trying to tell me what their problem is. Well, what the problem is, is I'm sitting there listening to them, and they are nowhere near what I know what the problem is. But I'd be respectful and listen to him anyway. But this is the way it was with Peter. Peter listening to the Lord talk about fishing. Peter said, they going, you know, now I'm a fisher. You know, I know you're preaching. You got some good stuff to say, but I'm a fisher. So we've been fishing all night. And we ain't doing nothing. We know all the best places to go to. We know the certain areas where they bite, where they bite, how they bite. We know this. 
We didn't need all that. Now, I'm kind of paraphrasing because Peter didn't probably didn't say all this, but then he did. And he said, we didn't done, we didn't been out here, we didn't fishing, fishing, and we didn't, we ain't caught nothing. We tied, we didn't already clean out our nets off. And see, to clean these nets up and get them fixed up, I don't know how long it takes. Let's just guess and say it takes about two hours. Then it took me at least two hours to get all this stuff together, pack them, fold up ready for the next launch the next day. You want me to undo all of that just to throw out when I already know the fish ain't biting the day. Ain't nothing happened. But Peter had also been there with Jesus with teaching. And again, we don't know what Jesus was teaching, but I'm sure Jesus probably said some of his message similar to you just need to listen. You need to obey. You need to trust God. Who knows? Maybe Jesus told the story when he said there was three men that he gave talents to. He gave one, one talent and one, two talent, one five talents. And the one with one did nothing. It ended up with nothing. Maybe he told that story. And Peter heard, no doubt, everything Jesus said. And Peter was like, well, I'm not going to be like that story he just told. You know, I don't, I don't think this is a good idea, but if that's what he wants us to do, at least I'm going to be obedient. So Peter, Peter said, nevertheless, in other words, I really don't want to do this. I think it's a waste of time. It's probably going to cost me a whole lot of extra work, but nevertheless, at that word, because you said it, we'll do it. Now, if Peter had one out there and caught nothing, he could have said it or he could have at least thought it. I tried to tell him. I tried to tell him. I mean, you know, they do. We gotta fold these nets up again. They gotta also understand Peter been fishing all night. They got the nets falling all together. They trying to get home to their wives or families and stuff. They, they probably got other things they need to do. Plus, they're probably hungry. We got time to be going back out fishing again. Not now. We gotta get to the family. And you know they probably got family that's complaining. You don't think they had a wife at home. You're always out there fishing. You're working all the time. You're kidding yourself. Hot out there. You mean so many told you to go out again and you didn't catch nothing? Then you had to put up with all this. But Peter took the chance to say, well, I'm probably get jumped on and be, you know, it's going to be mad at me all night. But nevertheless, at the word, we'll do it. Amen. You see, I want you to understand. It's not 100% nothing wrong with doubt because the good Lord can deal with doubt. It's not wrong with doubt, but the problem with doubt is when you let the doubt control you. When you give in to the doubt. See, it's okay to wonder if this is right. I mean, even John the Baptist say, well, go ahead, Jesus is he the one should we look for another. Because I'm going to be in this dungeon, man, locked up, and ain't nothing happening. I can't hear what's going on. I mean, you know, was I wrong? Are you just here to introduce the one that's coming after you, or are you the one? Mm. And the good Lord didn't say, go tell John that I am the one. Yeah. He said, tell him what I'm doing. Because John knew enough to know the scriptures to know that he would heal a broken heart, and that he would preach to the poor, that the captives would be set free. So when he told John, what he was doing, John was like, that's the one. Mm -hmm. Because that's what the scripture said, the one that will come with them. So, we, so John was like, whatever happened at this point, at least I know I did my part. He was confident. Now, it's hard to get prepared to die. Uh, none of us here had, had ever had to uh, go up, get prepared for that. So don't say you know. And don't say you can die for the Lord. I know you've been in church a long time. But don't say you can because you don't know if you can or not until you face with it. Until you face with it. So in other words, it's not all the doubt because the Lord at least can work with the doubt. So Peter was like, he had doubts, but he at least was smart enough to know, well, but I'm going to do it, even if it costs me. So Peter launched out in the deep, and he goes out, and he let his nest down. And all of a sudden, it gets heavy. Now, for those of you that don't know anything about fishing, and I'm not trying to say I'm a great fisherman or anything, but it wasn't like fishing pole. We didn't have that fishing like that. They had these great big old giant nets. And the net could be as about as some small, some about as big as one old owl or something. And 
And it was big and it was round and it was nets. And on the end of the nets was weights. So you take the net, and they got machines that do it now. Back in those days, you throw them. And you throw the nets way out. And it falls flat on the water. And the weights on the end of the nets will make the weight, make the uh, whole net go down. And when it goes down and it gets on the fish, now the fish trying to get out of us. They see what's about to happen. And then they pull the cord. And then that whole net closed together like a big ball. And all the fish that didn't get out in time is trapped in the net. Then when you pull the net in, you got a net full of fish. Mm -hmm. Alright, well normally you didn't pull in uh, a lot of fish to the point that it was more than you could handle. Because most fish were small enough to get away. They just fish. The fish you see them move fast, they get out of the way. But in this case, for some reason or another, it looked like they catch all of them. And they pull it in, and it's so much that the Bible said that the net broke. Now, when it said that the net broke, it didn't mean it just broke where it ain't no good no more. It mean parts of the net broke. Like it broke right, a little piece right here broke, so some of the fish probably got out and got away. Piece right over here broke, some of them got out. But overall, the majority of them was in there. Yeah. And they were pulling the fish in, and it was so many. Then they looked back at his partners, John and James, and hey, come on, man, y'all got to come help me with this. Come on, them boys came out there with the other boat. They throw the ears out. And the Bible says that they caught so many that the ship started sinking. Now basically what it means is that water started getting in the ship. It started getting in the ship because it was going down because of the weight. It wasn't until that point that Peter came to realize what was going on. See, Peter probably was caught up in, man, we get a lot of fish now. When did we get back to the market? We probably ain't got to work for the next three weeks. Man, we got to think everybody's going to be buying fish from us now. And on top of that, remember, we've got a lot of competition. So if you're the type of person that don't catch that many fish on a regular basis, the people that buy fish are going to go to the fishermen that always got a lot of fish. So while Peter didn't have this many fish, they're up in their reputation. Now they're at the point, everybody probably want to go to Peter. They, got, they know how to get fish. So if they got a pile of fish, they just pack. And I don't know, I, I would give anything to just see this person of Jesus' face while he's just sitting there watching them the whole time. Because they, they probably just look at him, just give him that look like. <laughs> and he just sitting there like, you know. I don't know, you think Jesus was having to pull this here, or you just sitting there chilling watching him? <laughs> it don't matter, you want to do this part, you know, when they the fish. So the fish coming in, they get the fish, everybody's happy. And Peter realized right then, hey, this is out of the ordinary. This ain't no ordinary fishing right here. I apologize for saying that, or even thinking that I'm the fisherman and not you. I realize that you are most powerful. You are something special. Mm -hmm. Peter realized that he was so special that he knelt down and told him that he wasn't even worthy to be around him. Mm -hmm. He said, get away from me. I'm a son. Now don't tell me God can't deal with a man like that. It ain't nothing worse than a man that's up yet to think he all that. Especially, you know, you know, you're preaching with somebody, or you're doing something great. I mean, you know, you see it all the time, you know, people walk around, they all that. But, I mean, just proud. God don't deal with a lot of proud people. A humble person. Now, I also want you to notice this. On my job, I'm going to change this just a little bit, just, and I'm going to get back to this. So on my job, if you want to come, if you want to get the position I got, like in a line or something, you have to take a test, you have to take another test, another test, there's like three tests you got to take. Then you got to go through something like a boot camp, you got to go through a whole lot of stuff. Then it's, it's a whole lot. Then you got to go through this big uh, uh, interview. And the interview is the biggest thing, because you got about three or four men sitting down doing the interview. They, you got three or four people asking you questions. And it's, it's, it's just, it's amazing what you got to go through just to get this job. Okay? That's just to get the job. Now, imagine God wanting to go out and interview some people to work for him. Now, you're not going to be working for them to you. Them to just a couple. Or working for some plant, or working for the post office, or working for UPS, or any place. Those are just places. Those are just jobs. But now you got this individual, God Almighty is going to be interviewing you to work for him throughout the whole world. That's the biggest job on the planet. You can't get no job bigger than that. This is the most powerful job in the world. It's bigger than being the president, being a senator, a governor. This is the biggest
big, working for God Almighty. That is the one you got to answer to. When you go push the clock in, you got to go push the clock in because you're working for God Almighty. That's a big position. So what kind of interview is God going to be giving you? Now, you would think that he's going to want somebody who is knowledgeable in the Word, who knows the Bible, who knows every chapter, every verse, where it's at on time. That's the person you want to have for the job, right? You want a preacher that knows it. You want a preacher that's been to school, seminaries, you know, all this stuff, smart, highly educated, and taught by the best. That's what you want. That's what God probably wants to work for him. Somebody that's gifted and knowledgeable and know all this stuff. I mean, why would he not pick somebody like that? I mean, you know, because what you will be doing, you'll be preaching to people. You'll be talking to people. I can't have no anybody just talking to people that don't know my word, they don't know who I am, what I stand. I can't have no anybody doing this. I gotta get the best of the best of the best to do this. My son trains about basketball, and one time he thought he was really, really good. I'm real good. I'm real good. I said, man, if you ever even make it to the NBA, if you ain't even get there, you're gonna find out how small you are. Because you got the best all over the world coming. You can be the very best at your school, and nobody at your school can touch you. And then when you get before the pros, you can sit on the bench the whole time. Because you ain't qualified to be out there with them guys. Mm. See what I'm saying? The point I'm making. So the point I'm making is God's gonna call, God's gonna call you for this big, big job. You think he's gonna call the best of the best. So who is he gonna call during that time? He's gonna call the Pharisees. These boys, you see them robes, them boys wear them, they all see them. They got some bad robes. Now I don't think they got the robes up there better than the Pharisees. The boys had that robe and get them uh, now diamond, all kind of pearls going down on them, man. They had them nice gold and cloth on them, and they had the left feet. They had the boys, the bad boy. They walk out there, they were tough, man. You, you know they were fancy. And them boys, and some of them had bells on their feet. And you could hear them coming, damn, damn, fancy. Yeah, I'm fancy. So God gonna call somebody. He gonna call a fancy. You know why? Because first they got the scrolls. They got they, this gifted brother. He ain't no way about it. So if God gonna call somebody, he's gonna call them first. And then he's gonna work his way down, you know, and get some low class folks, maybe. He goes to some fishing with All these boys do is catch fish. They don't really know the word no more than what people tell them. What have they learned from their parents? What have they heard from the Pharisees? What have they heard from the temple? What have they heard from word of mouth? They don't really know the word. And this is what Jesus goes to. He goes to these guys. See what I'm saying? He said, they said, God will take the foolishness of the world to confound the wise. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? You know, some people, man, you know, they like, I've heard people say, you know, and I don't argue with them when I hear you. I say, yeah, uh, I got my son going to school when he's trying to be a minister. <laughs> you know, that's great. Go to school with another thing, that's something. And I want you to just be still and wait on God to call you, wait on him to get you. He know where you at. The Bible says him, he called, he also qualifies. He know where you at. And a lot of times he wants you just like you are. Because he can train you. Now that's no thing about good gifts, for example. Now, we don't like to hire a lot of times, and you know, probably going out in the air, but a lot of times we don't like to hire someone from another company. Because if you hire someone from another company, they already trained from the other company. We want somebody that we can train in our way. Same thing with the Lord. The Lord want to train you his way. If you got a whole lot of training from somewhere else, then you will be ended up thinking that that's why you're so good at what you do. You are great because you've been to the biggest schools. You did all this great. And you know what Paul said? He was taught like a man. He had been here. He taught he, he, he knows several languages. You know what Paul said out of all that? He said, I can't it all dumb. Mm. Now, anybody here know what dumb is? Mm. Yeah, you know what dumb is, right? So if, I, I'm not going to say it, but if I did say it, Paul said, I can't it all. That's what he said. <laughs> that's what it is. All this money I got ain't. And that's what he said. Technically. That's what the Bible says he said. <laughs> Amen. It's nothing. It means nothing compared to what God has given me. Because God qualifies them. So Jesus goes to the goes to fishmen. And Peter first words is, I'm not even worthy. Get away from me. Okay? That's a humble spirit. 
The first thing you got to realize that you don't know God is number one that you are lost, that you are unworthy. Because you are. We're born in sin. See, the reason why we're born in sin, number one, was because my forefathers. See, my mama was born in sin, her mama did so, and it had to be. Alright? So, because they put sin in the world, we was all born in sin, she had iniquity. Now, had I died while I was young and before I became to the age of accountability, okay, all right, God would have winked at that and looked at that and brought me on in. But when I got to the point of knowing right from wrong and knew better and heard God's word and then about to say, man, I ain't got time for that, then I would have been lost. Okay? So, we all want to sin. So, when you come to the realization that you are lost, that you don't know God, okay? That's the first thing. You lost, you don't know God. And then you got to come and realize who can save you. Because the world will tell you that there's a lot of different people that can save you. And I'm here to tell you, there ain't but one. There ain't but And I, I know you heard all the stories about even the Bible we read that, you know, some man put this in our head to make us believe this Bible to keep us in control. I got you on all this. And if that by itself was all I heard, I might have almost believed that. But from the experience from God's Word, and when I go through and when I'm hurting and when I, and things are happening in my life, and the Word is what keeps me from doing something stupid and foolish, or being hurtful, or going through. Then, if, if, if you see, when I'm going through, if this word didn't help me, I would probably say, yeah, somebody, you know, messed me over and put this out there to control me. But this word actually keeps me. Yeah. It keeps me from doing something stupid. This word has helped me from hurting people. It has helped me from hurting myself. It has helped me from giving up. It has helped me to go on. It is power in God's word. Amen. So it is power in God's word. And so God called, he called the disciples. They was fishing of a low class in a sense to, to other men. And even the Pharisees know that when they saw them, they, they looked at them as just fishermen. It's amazing because later on, down the road many years later, when they heard the disciples talking, some that didn't really know who they was say, uh, I perceive that y'all have been with Jesus. See, they can tell that they had been with Jesus. They knew Jesus was highly knowledgeable. The, the saddest part about it was that many people didn't really know who Jesus was. They knew who Jesus was. I mean, it wouldn't even been a question how smart he was. I mean, that's all he was God. I mean, he didn't, he didn't learn the word. He was the word. He didn't have to learn it. He was the word. So it was easy for him to say what he said because he wrote it. I mean, you know, if I'm the one made something, why you ask me about it? I know. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, so he called the disciples and Peter, man, he, he on down, he couldn't, you know, he realized. But you know what? What I thought about, you know why Peter realized that this was a great miracle? You know why Peter realized that catching all this fish, that this had to be from God, that this was a miracle, this was something special? It really wasn't because of all the fish he caught that made him believe that God was real. It wasn't this great catch that he's like, man, this guy didn't come. What made him believe that this was God was the fact that he hadn't caught nothing before. Y'all get it so far? It was his failure. It was his downfall. It was what he was going through that got him prepared for when God came. You see, when you're going through and you're hurting and you're having problems and things ain't working out for you, and you got all kinds of stuff in your life and you wonder why it's happening to you, why you got to go through, that is what builds you up. That is what's making you. You see, if everything in your life is smooth, I mean, you got the perfect home, the perfect job, the perfect mind, and everything's going on, and nothing's going on, ain't nothing happening. I'm not trying to say anything negative about that, but you're not really knowing anything. It is when you hurt him. It is when you're going through when it's contrary, when it's, when it's rough. Amen. The anointing don't come easy. Yeah. That's a price that comes with being anointed. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also a greater price for the end. Yeah. There's a crown that we 
praying and stuff, and I'm not like, you know, what the Bible says. But every day and day, you have to tell people what God says. Every day and day. So every day and day, every once in a while, I say, you know what the Bible says. And I've had people get mad. They go, oh, you told the Bible. That's all you need to just talk about. You, the Bible says, you act like you're perfect, like you live just right. No, it ain't about me living right. It's about what God's Word says. It don't matter if I fail every day. God's Word still says A, B, C, and D. And I'm just telling you what the Word says. I'm not, I mean, if you look at me and then try to compare the Bible on my life, you don't really miss it. Because my life does not measure up with the Bible. I'm sort of like you. I'm trying to live day by day. I'm trying to do it right the best I can. And even in the midst of that, I may come short. That's not to glorify anything. I'm just making it plain to say, we will come short from time to time. But the point is, don't wallow in it, don't stay in it, deal with it, fix it, move on, learn from it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. But still, you got a job. You got to quote God's word. You got to live, you got to live a life that people will see God in you. And so we see here, it was the fact that Peter, when he didn't catch anything, that made him realize this got to be God. Amen. Amen. When God came, and then, let me tell you something else. You don't know when God's coming. You don't know when God. For those of you who may be watching my way of air or whatever, maybe God got a call on your life. And you don't know when he'll come. I know when you think he's coming. He will he'll come on a Sunday morning when you're in church. Everybody's there, right? <laughs> Amen. I turned for the Holy Ghost down a lot of times this morning back in the days. It came when I was at the house. <laughs> I'm in Smyrna, literally, 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 literally. I had one person say, hold on, other person say, let go. <laughs> Somebody said, reach. Somebody said, there you go. I was listening to all those voices. And what I was looking for, I don't know about y'all, but I was looking for something like, I was waiting to feel some kind of electric shock or something come over me. I was waiting for something. And I was like, oh, that's it, that's it. I was waiting on, because I've seen other folks before. As a matter of fact, when I was a little boy, I saw somebody, they, they, I guess they got the Holy Ghost, what they said they did. They got the Holy Ghost. They ran and they ran into a set of blood wall. They did. I was a little boy, they ran. Ah, boom! <laughs> Head first. And I said, whatever they got, I don't want it. <laughs> I did. As a little boy, that's exactly what I said. So whatever they did, I don't want it. And I was scared as a little girl on it. I was. Every day and then, when the spirit got real good, the service going good, I was like, scared whatever they had was going to fall on me. I did. I was like, I was just there for the meal because after church, we had a meal every day. I was there to get that free meal. And I'm telling the truth, I was going to church like that. <laughs> Amen. But nevertheless, as I got older, I got more mature, I realized, you know, you know, some folks is, you know, going looking above, I mean, some folks is going to the motions. That's it. Some folks just, you know, they acted. That's just said all it is to do, they just acted. I mean, you see the kids, you know, the kids can bring them up. Man, the kids, man, they, it's not that they're bad, they just do what they saw. You ever see kids cussing? You know why? A <laughs> cussing goes on somewhere, they hear it. They're professionals. Kids can rehearse something. You know, like, like I, I was going on a trip one time, me and uh, my little nephew, my little niece, brother, she was a little girl at the time, she grown. And this is rap that she told him all the time. And the guy, he rapped, this, this is what he said to me when he rapped. I have never, now I did like the beat, I'll admit, the beat went, I like the beat, but I had to have a clue what this guy was saying. And I would always listen to him, I forget what he was saying. I had all the niece with me. She was probably about seven years old. So we read it, and she was singing it word for word to the teeth what he was saying. For the first time I understood what he was saying because I was hurting her love. Look, kids can pick stuff up, man. They can pick it up. They know. And he, if she knew the rap that he did, she was just ratting on, ratting on. And then the kids today, kids today, man, you know, my son, same way we to call it, he knew every song that comes on, every element. Now, how you feel in the school, man, but you know every rap song? <laughs> how in the world is that possible? Because most people can't learn all that. So it goes to let me know that you got what it takes to learn. Amen. So we see here that nevertheless, you know, it's, it's all about what you what you do. So now we see here that Peter, of course, God called him, and Peter realized that he 
was among a great man of God. And the Lord looked at him and said, Peter, don't fear. Don't fear about what's going on. He said, from here on out, you will be catching men. When he was telling Peter, what I'm calling you to a higher calling, fishing is the thing of the past for you. Now, Peter and John and James, they probably said that day, they left everything behind and followed Jesus. They left their career. Now, I'll tell you, it's not easy to, to leave what you used to to serve God. See, before I got saved, I should always say that I didn't know if I could live for the Lord. Because in order for me to live for the Lord, I used to drink at least, on an average, six beers a day. I smoked at least a pack and a half to two packs of cigarettes. And I had friends come over and we talk junk, cuss and fuss, and have the time, and we talk about all kinds of stuff. And I didn't know if I was going to get that up. Then I, I didn't. Now, for those of y'all who don't think sin is fun and good, I mean, you know, don't deceive yourself. That's what people say. It's fun. It's good. That's a lot of good things that goes on in sin. That's what people do it. It's a great feeling. You feel good. You happy. It's the outcome of sin that gets you. It's like using a credit card. You know, you got a credit card, $5,000. It's a great feeling. $5,000 credit card. And then one day you call up to see what you owe, and they say, you owe four thousand six hundred dollars. <laughs> you ain't get but four hundred dollars left on your credit. See that—that's when it's a problem. It's a problem when you gotta pay up. But it wasn't a problem when I was using it. So we see that sin is great. Why are you doing it? Why are you about it? It is great. It's happy. It's a good time. I mean, people wouldn't say it. It wasn't fun. But when it's time to pay up, is where it comes from. That's why you gotta do it God's way. You can do it your way if you want to. But I'm telling you, your way always comes out bad for you. You lose out. You got to do it God's way. That's the best way. The Bible said God's way is easy. Amen. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He, see, God's way is not hard. It's not hard as you think it is. So I'm thinking that before I got saved, all that I got to give up. Can't go in, can't go here, can't do this, can't do that. I'm not ready to do all that. And I was having fun in what I was doing. To give all that up just to serve God. But you know what? I look back now, 37 years ago, you know, it wasn't bad. <laughs> yeah, I lost some things along the way, but I only lost what, what was good for what things that weren't good for me anyway, that was weighing me down. And I learned from it. I'm gifted at some of the things I've went through. Now, I'm smart at it. I know why things happen when they happen. I know why people, some treat people do what they do. Some people are just lost and bound. The devil has a lot of people bound. It's, and it hurts me to know that, that some people are just bound. And I, and I know people who have done stuff and now their life is miserable. They are unhappy. Their outcome didn't turn out to be great. And I see it. And so therefore, I've learned that, that when you do it your way, oh yeah, it might look good up front. You might get all this and get all that. I mean, think about all the actors, and I need to bring this to a close. Think about all the actors and, and the people that's famous and big time and get all this money. I mean, look at their lives, man. They ain't happy. How in the world can you have a big old $20 million home overlooking the city, swimming pool, you got 10 cars in your driveway. The cheapest one is a $100,000 car. You go where you want to go. You do what you want to do. People are giving you stuff. People are falling out when they see you. They want your autograph. And you want happy. They got actors who will kill themselves. Kill yourself with all that? People would not have that. So you see, there's really no happiness in it. So you see what I'm saying is if you do it your way, in the end, there is no true happiness that comes with it. But when you do it God's way, when you do it God's way, so Peter and the disciples and John and James, they did it God's way, nevertheless, that thou will. And they did it, and then the Lord said, Come and follow me. And they followed him. To this day, 2021, we are still talking about John, James, Amen. We're still talking about these boys. 
We still know who Peter was. We, what about all the other fishermen that day that was out there? You don't have a clue who they was. Not a clue. What about all the disciples? I mean, all of the Pharisees. When we talk about Pharisees, what are we talking about? Pharisees. They don't call out too many names. There was a whole lot of hundreds of Pharisees. You don't know none of them. None of them. They all died out. You only knew a few of them. Amen. So what I'm trying to say is that when Peter, when they did it, they lost weight. Right today, thousands of years later, they're still well known for what they did. They had changed the world. They had. They realized who they were walking with. And then the Lord called them over. Now, in my clothes, the Bible said, many are called for your children. So, God calls many. He had a whole lot of disciples. For those of y'all that don't know, it was over 100 some disciples that the Lord had. For they all just like he had 12. It's over 100 some, probably more. He had. But it was 12 that he called. See what I'm saying? Now, it don't mean that the ones that were with him weren't good. It's just that he had 12 Pacific that he pointed out for a certain reason. Would you like to be that person? Would you want to be the point that the Lord choose you? He picked you out. Because there's something about you that God can use. But there are other folks God can't trust. He can't. I said before with my children, and I'm not going to call the name. They probably know which one it is. Uh, one I can pay on, another one I can't. But I love them all. See what I'm saying? So therefore, God loves all people, but that's not he can depend on the son again. <laughs> Plain and simple. Some folks you just, they just not go, they, you can't depend on. But then that's not you can. Amen. And so we see here that he called them out. They saw the great miracle. And they and Peter didn't didn't buck against him and, and all this because if he had a book against him, we probably wouldn't be reading about Peter today. We probably wouldn't be reading about somebody named. Andrew or something. Because God would call somebody else. Because when you don't do it, he'll just call somebody else. Then again, he could have called a rock. Because you know, God can do that too. Yeah, the rocks will cry out. Somebody said, I don't want no rocks crying out for me. <laughs> Amen. I don't want no rocks to do. I mean, rocks ain't got no arms and legs and ears. Amen. No, you ain't got to use a rock, use me. So therefore, we see here, if you do it God's way, your life will be better. If I don't say anything else, I want to say to you all and those that may be listening, God has a call on your life, which you've got to acknowledge. Now, if you're not sure if it's God, I understand that, because you got to trap spirit by spirit, you just can't do, because God's not going to ask you to do anything before he's going to kill somebody or something, you know, or jump off a bridge or something like that. He's not going to ask you to do that. Now, I will say this, that if he did, hey man, you better talk to him two or three times, make sure that's him. Well, what I'm saying is the Lord had told some people in the past there's some stuff that them like, like uh, I think Jose and told them about a prostitute. I mean, that was a big one. So basically what I'm trying to say is that you just make sure it's God. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Make sure that it's God. Amen. 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 And if it ain't God, if you see us wondering if it's God, it probably ain't. <laughs> Amen. But the main thing what I'm saying is and in God's word, God don't have to tell us to do anything before we it away. Because it's all in his word what he wants to do. Read his word. Study his word. Amen. Seek God. Amen. He will give to you. And do it his way. Do it God's way. Because when you do it God's way, in the end, you will be happy. Now, you will go through some stuff, and there may be some times you'll be unhappy, and you'll feel sad. Amen. But I'm here today to tell you, God always replaces the pain that, that comes in your life. The loss that you have, he'll replace it. He will. He will. And my clothes, I would say this. I remember that, you know, my mom used to always, when I get off of work, I would always step out of the house and get something to eat. And, because she would cook like crazy. Matter of fact, and I got in trouble one time with my wife because she was always, you have to stop eating, mom gets something to eat. So I had to stop eating all the time. Well, I did, when I did go eat, I would basically go get something to eat. Mom, you ain't me. I didn't tell her to eat much. <laughs> So I had an appetite when I got home. But nevertheless, when mom's passed, I thought getting something to eat was a thing of the past. I'm never, that, that's, I don't have a lot of the fixed up for me. And my mother passed and about three or four years later. I think I had three people, man, that called me. You know, come by and get something to eat? I fixed something extra. Now, for those of y'all who've been thinking while, and most of these older ladies who were very respectful like mamas, and they was looking out for the brother. So God have a way of replacing 
God will replace. Nobody can replace mom. But what I'm saying is, the loss you may take in life, God will replace it with more. He always will. God will bless you. You won't miss a beat. If you do it God's way, you'll be happy. Your life will be better. Amen. It won't be perfect if you won't stuff. But it's still better. It's better than they're going the devil's way. A lot of my friends, some of them go with me and went to some stuff, some of them already gone because of the, the path that they chose. And I could have been one. But I'm still here, decent help, I can change them all. But right now, I'm giving God to pray. I'm always giving the praise. Because it is well with my soul. Amen. And even if I was to leave here, I know some depending on me, like my family. But still, it would be well with my soul. Amen. Because I know where I'm going. At least I believe in my heart where I'm going. Amen. So it's a win-win. If I stay, amen, I'm all right. If I leave, it's even better. Amen. It's a win. You can't lose. So do it God's way. You don't do it another way. Amen. We're going to stop right there because, you know, preachers, we preach all day. I told you, Lord, he preached all day long. Amen. I'm one of his kids. Man, chip off the block. <laughs> so that being said, in my clothes, I say to you, whatever you want to, how bad it may be, how tough it may be, do it God's way. See, it's fun, and I know you want to do it that way. But try your best to do it God's way, because in the end, you'll be better off. You'll be happier. It'll be well with you. And God will bless you. Amen. 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 so rich and powerful. That's all we can be ready to let you go. You spent well. And the main thing, saints, don't hide. Let God lead you. He'll take care of you. God's not going to do anything to harm you. Would you give your child a fish or would you give him a serpent? So God will do what's right for you as long as you keep him first in your life and love him and love one another. Because the world man is in bad shape around the world. People are divided. I never thought I would see in America someone would attack the capital. Americans attacking the capital. And then they try to come again. I never thought that would ever happen in my son called me said they have they have breached it. The brethren at the Capitol. I said, no, not in America. They did. I never thought that would happen to an American citizen. So we're in a bad place in that sense. We're in a bad place. Bad place. You got people want driving truck with flags and things on it and showing division in this country. Russia don't have to, Russia don't have to, and they don't have to do anything. We will divide and conquer ourselves. Amen. They don't have to come in to our book. They don't have to do anything. We are being destroyed from within because of people that are divided. So it's up to the church. It's up to you to pray for this nation. Amen. True men and women of God. Then you got church against what's right. Amen. So it's a danger. Yeah. Satan has tripped in. Educational system, healthcare system, government, see is involved in everything now. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You can't even trust your food now. You don't know what you're eating. They got that it's, it's you corn, everything has been engineered, been changed. Everything has been messed with. <coughs> so you pray for this nation. You pray for the president, you pray for the people in charge of this country. Amen. You pray, it's time. Pray for our military. They've been infiltrated with the enemy. Everywhere you look, the enemy has got involved. In marriages, in homes, everywhere, the devil has got involved. 
So what we got to do, we got to what? Put the devil out. What is the devil? Does anybody know? What is the devil? Does anybody know what the devil is? It's your mind. It's the way you think it. The devil don't have a red suit on. It's the way you think it. You can, the spirit of the devil has to calculate people's mind and they think like what he will do. And if you say, what will Jesus do? That's the matter we should have. What will Jesus do? So we know the devil's in business. He's a spirit. He's destroying. But we will pray. Let's all stand. And give our hands to have that beautiful message. Remember, saints, let's bring a little back yeah. in the marriage, in the relationship, in the homes. Let's love. And love don't mean you're a fool. Mm. Love don't mean you're a fool and you're a, a flow man. That's not love. If you mistreat me, you don't love me. Amen. If you beat on me, you don't love me. Jeez. That's not love. Don't be confused now. If a man don't feed you, don't take care of you, he don't love you. Amen. If you get paid and don't bring no money home, he don't love you. Jeez. If a woman get paid and don't want to bring no money, she don't love you. Amen. Love is about what you do, not what you say. Oh, Amen. Amen. You can say you love me, but you just say you don't do anything for me. Something wrong with that picture. It's not a one side thing. Same thing with church. If you come to church and you don't feel love and you're not treated right, you're not respected, that's not church. That's a meeting place. Amen? I don't want nowhere that I don't want to be. Amen. If you don't want me to your restaurant, I ain't going there. I ain't spending my money with you. Amen. If you don't respect me, I don't buy your clothes, I don't buy your food, I don't buy nothing from you. That's not hate. That means I'm, I'm just smart enough to know that if you don't love me, you might poison me. Amen. Amen. If somebody takes your food and you get mad and send it back, you don't know what they put in your food. <laughs> I go down the street, I go somewhere, I ain't got to buy nothing here. We don't serve y'all here. That's okay. Keep your food. I got money. I go somewhere else. I'm not going to go to your place because you're white or black or whatever. I go there because I feel opportunity. But if you don't treat me right, I'm due. I don't go back. So stop being a like I say, if somebody don't want to serve you, when well, you got some no, you go somewhere else. Don't let people treat you. You're, if your church is not serving you, go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Whatever you go, people have to respect you. You are a child of God. Mm -hmm. They're going to respect you as I leave. I'm not going to be mistreated. Amen? Mm -hmm. If you're in a marriage, I'm going to say this, you're going to be mad as part of man. If you got a marriage, and you're in a marriage and you've not been treated right, you've been beat on, you've been mistreated, something wrong with you stay in that relationship. It's sexual abuse, mental abuse, and physical abuse. If you've been being abused, male or female, you've been in the wrong place. You need to get some help. Jesus is the help. He says, 33 to 31st Psalm this week is going to clear some things up in your mind, your spirit. Preacher, leave him. I ain't saying you leave nobody, have I? I ain't saying you leave nobody. I'm just saying, God, if a person loves you, they're going to treat you like somebody. Amen. You're not going to be no E's and no H's and all these bad names they put on you. You're, that's not your name. You're not a B, you're not an H, you're, you're, you are you have a name. Don't let people call you out your name. You're not a girl, you're a woman. And I hate that people use that word to female. Wrong thing about calling girl. No, you're not a girl, you're a woman, you're a lady. You're not a child. I'm not a boy, I'm a man. Amen? Amen. So a lot of people mistreat you and call you out your name. Because you say, no, my name, God called me, said, uh, called me Pops. I, I, my name is not Pops, my name is Thomas. He said, I'm sorry. To clarify, English is. A bliss. Don't let people give you even returns on you. You are somebody. Don't be calling him, hey mama, I'm not your mama. My name is Mary. Your mom's at home. I, you're not my child. Clarify. Make people respect you. Amen. Amen? Amen. 
Not bees, not ages. You are women. You are men. You are somebody. I'm God's child. Amen. You are being dismissed. We don't. We not. We, we don't end services. We continue. Amen. And you be dismissed in Jesus' name.